These are 10 of the best questions that Twitter asked me about the most performant EVM blockchain. My name is Keone Han, one of the co-founders of Mana. Question one, from the current testnet performance, do you have anything you want to change or remove from the current Monad architecture to optimize it. There are three changes that are going to be implemented in testnet prior to the launch of Monad mainnet. Those three things are the introduction of the new Monad BFT consensus mechanism, the introduction of staking, and a change to the gas fee model. The new Monad BFT consensus mechanism is introducing a completely new consensus mechanism. There is going to be staking for permissionless decentralized control of the network and a new dynamic gas fee model will dictate the pricing of gas. Question two, what is the most underrated feature no one is talking about that they should be? I think there are a lot of interesting features within Monad's architecture. One that is underrated right now is Monad BFT itself, because although there's been some discussion of pipelining in consensus mechanisms, Monad BFT actually introduces resilience to tail forking, which is the biggest problem that pipelined consensus mechanisms have. Tail forking happens when a leader misses their slot. That actually knocks out the previous proposal as well. And this is a problem because it creates potential MEV attacks, and it also just increases unpredictability for people that are submitting transactions. Eliminating the problem of tail forking is massive because it creates more resilient consensus mechanisms that aren't subject to these kinds of MEV attacks with greater predictability for end users. It's going to be a huge improvement for consensus mechanisms overall. Question three, are there still major architectural uncertainties or unresolved issues? No. They're not. From an architecture perspective, Monad is feature complete. There are still some things that are being finalized, including the gas pricing mechanism, the exact controller that drives the dynamic gas pricing. And there's some, still some things that need to be implemented on the testnet, including staking and the new Monad BFT consensus mechanism. The design is complete. The architecture is well-defined. Things are fastly progressing. Question four. If Monad already beats most EVM L1s and TPS, is the focus now more on latency, composability, or dev experience as opposed to further optimization? Great question. At the end of the day, our goal is to make the EVM as performant as it possibly can be. There are a number of improvements planned both before mainnet and longer term initiatives that will land after mainnet. On the DevX side, we are focused on introducing ultra low latency access to events by directly interacting with shared memory. Additionally, we're focused on introducing web sockets, which is a really common request that we've gotten from developers. There are also improvements that are longer term efforts. On the latency side, there's work on a just-in-time compiler, as well as some potential improvements to the BFT consensus mechanism. And on the decentralization front, continue to raise the validator count from about 150 validators at mainnet to a longer term goal of over a thousand validators. Question five. What differences or upgrades are you guys pushing out with Testnet 2.0? Testnet 2 will be more of a experimental environment focused on validator performance and focused on pure load testing. Most users and applications will most likely stay on the current testnet. The current testnet will continue to run and will continue to be the primary means by which most people interact with testnet. Question six. What are your main takeaways from testnet so far? And how do you think this will affect mainnet as well as how it will aid crypto more generally? Our team has learned so much from the past couple of months of testnet. In general, there's been an incredible amount of activity, several hundred transactions per second, which translates to somewhere between 20 and 30 million transactions per day. But the level of load on the RPC is actually multiple orders of magnitude higher than that, with RPCs processing on many days over a billion requests per day. And the reason why there's multiple orders of magnitude more requests than there are transactions is because there are many, many, many read-only calls that are made to RPCs. Our team has learned a ton about how to make the RPC ultra-performant to scale to that level of usage, as well as to deliver really high-performance access to 
all historical data. For example, if you want all of the logs for one block or you want all the logs for one topic, making access to that really performant, which is a ton of data because there's so much activity on the testnet. Beyond that, we've identified various bugs and improvements in some of the auxiliary algorithms such as state sync and block sync and identified a lot of quality of life improvements for validators to make it a lot easier for folks to run nodes on Monad. And then I think expanding beyond that, the learnings have been calibrating all of the third-party infrastructure provider behaviors, such as indexers, wallet as a service, oracles, bridges, you name it. There's a lot of infrastructure that is there to support developers and each provider, each utility has been optimized in different ways to adjust to the performance level and the throughput on Monad testnet. Question seven, what happens if too many transactions conflict during parallel execution? The thing to know about parallel execution, you can think of it as a two-phase process. In the first phase, a bunch of transactions are all run in parallel to generate pending results, where each pending result is bookkeeping of the inputs and outputs that were read in or written to in that transaction. And in the second phase, those pending results are committed in the original serial order of transactions. There's always correctness. So we always produce the same end result as if we just executed these transactions one after the other. However, when one of the inputs is wrong, that transaction needs to be re-executed. Although it's more expensive than just being able to commit the pending result immediately, it is still quite fast in almost all cases. Instead of having to go all the way to the SSD to pull data, we can just use data that's in RAM. The inputs for that transaction are almost always in cache. As a result, re-executions are not very expensive and therefore this two-phase strategy in parallel execution can be really efficient. Question eight, explain Raptorcast to me like a child. One of the biggest challenges of building a network that's both really performant and also really decentralized is the block propagation problem. The block propagation problem is the problem of getting new blocks, which are produced by a single leader, sent to all of the other nodes in the network while not requiring very much bandwidth on the part of any of those nodes. Raptorcast is a new algorithm that allows leaders to send their blocks to all the other nodes in the network super efficiently. And this is accomplished using error correction codes to cut up blocks into a bunch of very small chunks and then deterministically assigning all of those chunks to be sent to individual validators in the network who are then responsible for forwarding those chunks to all the other nodes in the network. To give a really simple analogy, imagine that you lived in a human-sized Lego house, and then you had 200 friends who lived all around the world, and you wanted to give each of them a copy of your house so that they could also have a house to live in. The naive strategy would be for you to make copies of everything and then ship out all the copies to everyone. Obviously, this would require a huge amount of shipping bandwidth, be really inefficient. So a much better strategy would instead be to disassemble your Lego house into all of the little pieces, send each piece to one of your 200 friends, and ask them to make copies of each piece that they receive, and then send the copies to all of the other 200 friends. This is basically what Raptorcast does. It cuts up blocks into pieces and uses some error correction codes to make extra pieces in case some of the pieces get lost. It disseminates those pieces throughout the network and asks each of the nodes that receives it to forward it on to all the other nodes. And then when nodes receive all these pieces, they put, all, put the block back together and get the original Lego house. Question nine, is there a secondary client implementation that's completely separate from Category Labs' implementation? No. On day one of mainnet, all nodes will most likely be running Category Labs' implementation. It's definitely a goal of mine to see multiple client implementations, uh, but that is a longer term effort. Question 10, is there a story behind the name Monad? Yes, James Hunsaker originally came up with the name Monad. He chose it because he's a big fan of functional programming and a Monad is 
a fundamental unit of computation in functional programming. But it's turned out to be a pretty good name because about one in 10 programmers really like the project because they really like functional programming and the concept of monads. Monad also, when we researched it, we found out it had a lot of other meanings related to philosophy and religion. It means a single-celled organism, fundamental unit, or a singular deity, I believe. So there were a lot of cool philosophical and religious undertones as well. I also just think monad is a good name because it's an uncommon common noun, and it's hard to find those nowadays. I wanted to say thank you to the community for some really great questions. Keep them coming, keep questions coming, keep the feedback coming, and continue to push the needle in terms of asking critical questions as well as testing out everything on testnet so that testnet can be as robust as possible. For continuous technical updates, follow along on monad underscore dev on Twitter or blog.monad.xyz where we have a new blog. Mm -hmm.